at the National Yearling Cells, we find all types of people that arrive. And um, these people mostly know a little bit about horses, but some of them know a hell of a lot more than a little about horses. And one of them is James Bester. Now, for those of you that are uninitiated, James Bester um, is probably one of the doyen bloodstock agents in the world. And uh, he's very kindly uh, decided to come and chat to us today because he's got some interesting stories. I'm going to stay away from the inter interesting stories about our childhood. But, um, James, nice having you with us. Great to be here. Thanks, James. Now, you actually are a South African. Yes, indeed. I um, was born in Velkom, of all places. Grew up in Bloemfontein and then Durban and ended up in Cape Town. Went to school with you, as I recall. <laughs> we did spend a few years together. But then um, from there, you decided to get into the horse business. How was it that you got into the horse business? Well, I always loved riding. Um, I recall riding at Clifton Nottingham Road with you, and yeah. that was my you first love. You never beat love. me. You did win Horseman of the Year. I was runner-up to you, though. You were runner-up, of <laughs> course. <laughs> And horses were always my first love, but I went to university and my parents were quite keen that I should follow in their footsteps, and so I did a law degree, um, but felt that horses were my life, so I decided to follow a, a life with horses instead. And, and then you obviously ended up in England. Yeah, well look, it was hard to break into racing, so first I became a stipendary steward. I had gone through the army and been a detective in the South African police force, and seeing that uh, stipendary stewardship involved a degree of legal knowledge and a degree of detective work, if you like, and the horsemanship that I felt was my forte, I became a stipendary steward. And then a race caller with Jahan Malherba and um, joined Jahan in form bloodstock. Somehow ran into Ben Sangster, son of Robert Sangster, who uh, invited me over to England and... Uh, Invite and gave me a job as well on the Isle of Man. So I worked for Robert Sangster on the Isle of Man. What, what, what did he put you into f uh, to start your... Well, I, some yeah, I was assistant to his general manager, which means everything was covered, you know, everything from sales to racing to um, pedigrees. And the assistants usually do all the donkey work, which I'm grateful for because I covered a large area of horsemanship and of racing and breeding. And Robert, at that time, was probably the biggest racehorse owner in the world. He had about 1,500 horses around the world, including in South Africa and Venezuela, all over Europe and America and Australia. And that's where I started to set my si sights on Australia. And, and how was it working for him? Uh, I hear he was... Uh, I knew him vaguely, but um, I actually once played in his golf tournament in Barbados. Right. But well, uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, Robert was a true sportsman whose word was his bond. Handshake deals were all you ever needed with him. He was a, a raconteur, a bon vivant, and um, he loved characters. So we hung around with a lot of colorful characters, the Billy McDonalds of the world. And uh, we went racing every weekend, and obviously it was an eye-opening thing for me. And you became best friends with him. Very close, indeed, yeah. so yeah. that every time he came to Australia after I'd left, he helped me get my first job in Australia. And we would go out to dinner and we would do all sorts of things I can't talk about on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was a wonderful man. Yes, we were good friends. So from there, now you decide Australia is where you're going to be. And you moved there as a bloodstock consultant. Yeah, initially I got a job with... Um, Barrelmill Stud, which is now owned by Jerry Harvey, Jerry Harvey, the Magic Millions man. And that led to a job with Arrowfield Stud. And Arrowfield and Coolmore were bringing in stallions, uh, dual hemisphere stallions. And one way and another, I drifted the Coolmore way when the split came between Arrowfield and Coolmore. And I've been associated with Coolmore ever since. You're actually a blood co bloodstock consultant for them. You do a Yeah, look, I'm a bloodstock consultant in my own right. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, I'm also uh, contracted by Coolmore. Uh, I do 10 days a month for Coolmore and uh, do stock assessment and some uh, marketing of the stallions and some keeping an eye on the racehorses, so quite a few things. Only in Australia or Just in Australia. World? And how many horses would they have there, Coolmore? Oh, uh, probably, let's say, 50 in training, uh, mid-50s, 55 in training. 
uh, but obviously brood mares, I'd say 200 brood mares uh, and stallions, they stand 10 to 15 stallions every year. I, I, we were actually discussing it, Paul and I, the other day on our show, um, the stallion fees in Australia for Coolmore. And I think you've got American Pharaoh coming, haven't you? Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah he came out last season as well. That's, a, that's the biggest coup ever. How do you organize something like well, that? Well, Coolmore owns American Pharaoh, yeah. so... Um, so is Zayat not involved in the horse anymore? No, uh, he was. He raced the horse, yeah. but Coolmore bought the uh, stallion career. And as soon as he retired, off he went to Ashford Stud. And Coolmore's always taken the view that... Um, they don't earn any money grazing in the paddock in the off season, so they might as well do dual hemisphere duties. So American Pharaoh came over. But of course, he's an American legend. He's not um, an Australian type horse. So the great thing about that is that in order to make him popular or, or attractive to mare owners, they have to pull his fee right down. Yes. So he stood at 60,000 Australian dollars. Or fifty thousand US. And what US is he in America? Dollars. Well, he was about uh, two to three times between yeah. two and three times that, I'd yeah. say. Which it, it's ridiculous because the one thing I, I, the one stallion I love that you've got there is Uncle Mo, and he's been very unpopular in Australia. Yes, indeed, he doesn't come to Australia anymore. He came for two seasons, three seasons perhaps, and he just wasn't getting support from breeders. Um, these days, and I see it happening in South Africa a little too. Once the shuttle stallions had done their job, like Dane Hill and Last Tycoon and others, uh, Australians started to favour the homegrown product, the Redoute's Choices, who were born there, raced there, proven on, you know, in, on those circuits. Snitzel the same, not a single doubt. I am invincible. Uh, sometimes horses like Churchill, who's coming out this season, wonderful horse, and Caravaggio. Oh, even better can be underestimated now by the Australian market and therefore stand at very attractive fees compared with what they stand for overseas. I see here, for instance, your um, Captain Al's and your Jet Masters and those sorts of horses have now become the flavour of the month, your soft falling reins. Horses proven in this South African context are Boy. probably more popular now than the imports, are yeah. they not? I think that Elevation was probably the first or real horse that, you know, caught the, caught the eye of South African horses. And then obviously, as you say, Jetmaster came after him. Yeah, but, yes, indeed. Um, but it's been more and more difficult to buy really quality horses from South African point of view with, our, with the value of our rand. And yeah, absolutely, get here, you know, of course. Difficult. And Australia is very fortunate in that regard that we have probably the best melting pot of stallions in the world because in each stud season we have them from england ireland france america japan all over the world horses come to the southern hemisphere to stand in our southern hemisphere season we had galileo there we had and he was giants unpopular. <laughs> he was because you know horses for courses is the oldest saying in racing and um what you found was that the galileos pro it, it not so much the racing aspect, probably the training aspect, didn't suit them. The way we train our horses on race tracks, tight bends. Um, and they take time to mature. You, Australians seem to like fast horses. Absolutely. Precocity is highly valued, and we want two year olds to get out there. And we may have. Uh, Galileo had four stakes winners in his first two year old crop, mm. which people forget, but they didn't go on with it, and they were probably busted. Mm. So. You know, it's just one of those things. Giants Causeway didn't work there, but became champion sire in America. And Galileo is the best sire on the planet, probably in Without history. Without a doubt, yeah. But Australia wasn't for him. Talking about South Africa, you've had a long association, and the, uh, your association really is with um, the Platinum operation. Yes. Uh, some many, many years ago, 20-something years ago, Chris Snaith suggested to Sabina Plattner that they should buy overseas and that they should use me because Chris and I went back a long way and used to ride horses together, show jump together. And um, that started the association, which has been wonderful. We sourced horses like Laser Fair, who was a champion. She was a champion, yeah. And Joie de Gris, who was a champion. Yeah, okay, carry on. So um, it was a successful uh, uh, partnership. Yeah. And uh, while Sabina doesn't come to Australia every year anymore, she 
even indicated she might come out next year, but um, she likes to bring me over here to help her team buy horses. Magic Millions is uh, a headline sponsor of ours, and we always see you there. We have a good time. A good sale? Fantastic sale. You can buy anything there, can't yes, you? Yes, and look, it became a sale that, that uh, grew on, on type. It wasn't a sale for pedigrees. As a result, breeders put in their precocious horses, their speedy horses, that may have lacked a little pedigree, but um, were dead set race horses. And um, they've built up a formidable record, the Magic Millions, of graduates, to the point where now they're on a par almost with Inglis in terms of averages and highest prices. Inglis still, because they have the very best pedigrees at the top end, might outdo Magic Millions, but across the board, Magic Millions has uh, taken a huge market share from Inglis. James, it must have been difficult for a man who's South African born and bred to go and live amongst those Aussies. Have you fitted in? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, it's so similar, really. The Aussies love sport, they love the sunshine, they love a beer, they love a punt. And it's great. We have racing every day and high quality racing all across Australia. It's just been wonderful, I have to say. Well, I must say, it's been fantastic having you here with us and, uh, you know, expanding on some of those views and what you're involved in. And, uh, and really, we love seeing you back here. I know that you've got a couple of real good friends here. I love coming back. I have a brother who still lives in South Africa and a lot of friends and uh, getting to see them each year is fantastic. Well, Even if it does lead to hangovers like the one I have today <laughs> after the Mouton's <laughs> Hook party last That's night. That's a bit of a party, isn't it? Oh, it was unbelievable. And uh, I don't even know how I got home, but... Uh, I got well, home. As long as you got I home. Got back here. That's what, that's what it's about here. <laughs> James Bester, one of our greatest friends from Down Under, and uh, he's still a South African boy key, born and bred, but my goodness, has he made it in the bloodstock industry. And it's really great to be able to chat to people like this. We spend our time at sales, talking about pedigrees, talking about horses, and then, as you see, having a good time too. Until next time, enjoy.